one of my favorite subjects. That's kind of weird. Okay, coronary art heart disease caused by impaired blood flow to the myocardium. And a lot of times people are, could be asymptomatic, no problems whatsoever until they become symptomatic. Something happens. Maybe the clog, their arteries are clogged a little bit more. And they will start having angina pectoris, which we will go over. Acute coronary syndrome, an MI, dysrhythmias, heart failure, or sudden death. Okay, when I was going through school, I was under the impression that when we talked about an artery being blocked or somebody having an MI, that it was the blood flow going through the heart, you know, going from your atrium to your right atrium to your right ventricle. Well, oh boy, was I kind of not the smartest person. Um, what we're talking about with an MI is that we're talking about the arteries surrounding the heart, the arteries that are giving the blood to the muscle of the heart. So we have the right coronary artery, left main coronary artery, circumflex artery, and the left anterior descending artery. Now, whenever you get a cath lab report or somebody has an MI, they'll say, well, they, you know, had an infarct in their right coronary artery, or they had an infarct in their left main, or they had one in their LAD, okay? So that's where you might hear those words coming around when you're on in your clinical. Um, oftentimes people say about the widow maker, you know, the dreaded widow maker. He had an MI in his widow maker. What they're talking about is their left main. So right around here. And if you really look at it, if it clogs right here, look at all the heart that could possibly be damaged. So if it clogs right here, you're talking about your whole left ventricle. I mean, it's, you know, that's why it's called the widow maker. Because if that's clogged, there it's cutting off the supply of, of blood to the rest of the heart, basically. And remember that these arteries are going to the back side of the heart too. If you see the little um, explanations back down there. Okay, the left main artery, um, left a the LAD supplies the LAD in the circumflex. And you'll hear instead of saying circumflex, they'll just say the circ. And Okay, here's a picture of the right coronary artery, supplies the right ventricle, and the posterior descending artery supplies the posterior portion of the heart. Now keep in mind also that sometimes the infarct might be this artery down here. I wonder if you can actually see that. So let's go and play. Yeah, that's an eraser, I guess. Can you see that? Anyway, right back here could be the infarct. It, it's not necessarily the top or the biggest artery portion, it could be a smaller portion that we are looking at also. Okay, no surprises here. Coronary artery disease is one of the most common and serious effects about aging. We kind of consider it an old age disease, you know, because of years of hard living and making bad food choices and smoking and drinking and well, possibly illicit drugs. Those are all bad choices and it can lead to deterioration of your coronary vascular system. So coronary artery disease is normally what we think about the old person disease, but we have to consider the fact that coronary artery disease also affects the younger population also. We're seeing younger and younger people come in to the cath lab with MIs. I think last eight weeks, the youngest one we, we had was a 23 year old that needed uh, quadruple bypass surgery. So, you know, nobody's immune to CAD. So what do we consider coronary artery disease? Well, it's coronary artery spasm, arter arterial sclerosis and atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis is, because of, is caused because of lipid metabolism. It's abnormal, too many lipids in your body, right? Too much fat. It's also in, inflammation of the vessel lining and that could be caused for a variety of reasons. But hypertension, toxins in cigarette smoke, infections, um, all 
cause platelet aggregation. And that's where we bring in the aspirin, right? Because we don't want those platelets to aggregate. So the aspirin we use is for not antipyritic reasons, but for antiplatelet aggregation reasons. The results of coronary artery disease is either ischemia or infarction. And we will go through and talk about both of those. So an MI myocardial ischemia. Its oxygen supply to the cardiac cells is less than metabolic demand. Basically, the cells are dying um, from lack of oxygen, okay? It's related to the coronary perfusion and myocardial workload. So think about it. If your heart, if you are running, you're going to need more oxygen to, oxygen to your body. So those your coronary arteries have to be able to supply all that blood, that oxygen-rich blood, to your heart. If it's not able to, that's when you start having that chest pain, okay? Um, some of the medications we give decrease the myocardial workload, like beta blockers. You decrease the myocardial workload, and it decreases the need of oxygen to the heart. That's why chest pain will go away. Now, it's divided into two categories. There's chronic ischemia and acute ischemia. Okay, and this is a, a little bit of a nice little graphic on the different areas. So, arthrosclerosis with blood clot. So, you see this arthrosclerosis tissue right there. So, that's lipid, calcium, you know, basically things that we don't want. It's junk in our arteries. And what happens is a blood clot will come through and it will clot off right there. It will clot off that artery. Another thing is you can see this other tissue and how it's narrowing, okay? And through that narrowing is what could possibly cause. So you're having all the blood go through. And say you decide to run a marathon, pushing all that blood through, through that tissue, it's not going to get the blood where it really needs to go. And then we have spasms. I won't learn about the spasms, but you'll also have arterial spasms. And a lot of times when you have patients coming back from, um, from the cath lab, sometimes they're having chest pain, and it could be the spasming because of um, the procedure that they just went through. And this one's forever messed up. So risk factors, what do you think non-modifiable ones are? Non-modifiable risk factors. Mm -hmm. Listening? Yeah, I'm not going to hear much. Okay, so risk factors for non-modifiable. Um, age. Uh, culture. I guess culture could be kind of modifiable. Diabetes. Though you could, could, you could argue to me that, yeah, diabetes is non-modifiable. I'm talking about type 1. But if you stay controlled, that's kind of modifying it, don't you think? What else? How about being a woman? Or possibly being a man? You know, those are both mon non-modifiable. Now, what's really going to be interesting in a couple years, you know, with um, so many um, people realizing, you know, being transgender, where they're actually putting hormones in their body that, that their body's not used to. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how this is going to play a part in cardiovascular events. You know, for somebody to put a bunch of estrogen or testosterone in their body, you know, how's their body going to be able to handle that for future years? Okay, then we have modifiable. Well, smoking, eating Kentucky Fried Chicken, Long John Silver's, because Long John Silver's now has all-you-can-eat fish on Sunday. That's a heart attack rate to happen. What else? Well, I'm sure there's others. Crack. Meth. Pretty sure some of those others will go in there. Losing weight. Controlled hypertension. You know, we need to control the hypertension. All kinds of things we can do. Okay, emerging risk factors. You remember that handout I uh, gave you guys the first day, and I said, oh, here's a handout, and this is the homocysteine levels, but I'm going to test on you. 
Well, it's an emerging risk factor that shows that people with these certain levels could have an increased risk of CAD. CRP, that's an elevated inflammation. It shows inflammation in the body. Lipoprotein A, metabolic syndrome. Remember, we talk about metabolic system syndrome. It's a, you know, higher, um, what is it, higher waist. Um, I can't remember. I don't have the, it out in front of me. Um, but it's it's everything shows an increase in CAD. Risk factors unique to women, premature menopause, oral contraceptive use, and homo hormone replacement therapy. Now we used to use hormones all the time whenever somebody went through menopause. You know, people get hot flashes and it's very uncomfortable, I guess. Knock on wood, I haven't had them yet, but um, so they we get them hormones. Another risk factor for men menopause is uh, osteoporosis. So the thought was you give them the estrogen that they're, they're losing due to menopause and everything will be great, right? Everything will be wonderful. No hot flashes, no broken bones. But then they turned around and found out that all that um, estrogen they've been giving women all these years could also cause breast cancer and CAD. So now it's not given out like um, candy anymore. You really have to have the risk factors. You really have to have, be symptomatic before they'll really give you the estrogen. Oh, and the oral contraceptive use. Remember those wonderful um, commercials? If you're over 35 and a smoker, please, you know, use wisely um, because of the fact that it is an emerging factor for CAD. And then you add smoking to it, and then you add advanced maternal age to it, and you're looking at... Um, a real good possibility you have CAD and possibly an MI. Farmingham study it was a really cool study and this is why I didn't go for my PhD because I would never have thought of this. So what they did was they went into a town I believe it's New Hampshire somewhere up there um, and they looked at everybody and they in, you know interviewed the whole town and they tried to figure out what caused heart disease. So they research, they looked at their act activities, where they worked, what they ate, what they smoked, what they drank, and everything like that. Then they turned around and they researched their offspring and then their offspring. So it is still continuing that they keep on looking back at this, this town to find out the risk factors. And that's really where all the risk factors of CAD came from, was this Farmingham study. It was pretty ingenious if you ask me, is that they went and decided to look at a whole town and figure out what, you know, what caused those cardiac issues. Okay, manageable risk factors, quit smoking. Smoking is no good, okay? And if you have a patient and they say they're quitting smoking and they have a nicotine patch, get that nicotine patch off if they're going to light up. Okay, because that's too much nicotine in your system. The nicotine in your system is not only clog clogging the arteries in your um, heart, they're also clogging the arteries in, their, in your legs. Okay, some other risk factors for smoking, other than lung cancer, everybody thinks about lung cancer, but it's COPD, PVD, PAD, okay, peripheral vascular disease, peripheral arterial disease. Not only that, but... When I was in oncology, I would say nine out of 10 of our patients that had bladder cancer also were smokers. And you don't see that on TV, do you? But nine out of 10 of our, 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 our bladder um, cancer patients were smokers. So there's more risk factors than, you know, what the general population knows about. Weight loss and exercise. And if you can't lose weight, well, then get up and exercise. Okay, 30 minutes a day, three times a week. Bring your heart rate up to a cardiac level. Okay, get moving. Raise those HDLs. Control of hypertension, blood glucose, and cholesterol levels. Take the medications if you have to. Okay, control of hypertension. You know, once you're diagnosed with hypertension, you don't get rid of it. It's always lurking out there. Dietary modifications, reduction in saturated fat and cholesterol, and increase in omega-3, fiber, and B vitamins. So we have our medications that we can, you know, if people need help um, to lower their cholesterol, we got them.
okay? Statins, Lipitor, Crestor, and Provacal. Really, I should probably um, change these to the generics. So with statins, they have a bad rap about a lot of things. You know, early onset Alzheimer's, um, trying to think of everything. They have like as bad a rap as PPIs do, but they're really good at their job. They really keep the cholesterol down, okay? Though now there's some research saying that it doesn't really help, um, but I'm waiting for really good research before I make that decision. It can cause myopathies, okay? It can cause you to have painful legs, okay? The one thing with statins is you have to be careful careful of is rhabdomyolysis and that's a wasting of your muscle so it's a destruction of your muscle and because of that destruction of the muscle what happens is those dead cells go through the kidneys and those kidneys are then um basically injured okay they have acute kidney injury because of it before anybody starts a statin we're going to get um their liver functions okay what we do is we get their liver function, give them the statin, and we have them come back in like three months and see if those statins are hit and taking a hit in their liver. A lot of these medications are metabolized by the liver. So if they, the liver's taking a hit, we have to stop those medications and look for a different way, okay? Because we don't want to take out the liver just to lower the cholesterol. Okay, another one is idea. And again, it's... Oh, metabolized in the liver so we are very careful fish oil that lovely fish oil have you ever burped up fish oil let me tell you it's pretty darn disgusting but they now have burpless fish oil and if you're cheap like me and oh well i don't take fish oil really probably should but if you're cheap like me you don't want to buy the burpless fish oil you can tell your patients to put the fish oil in the freezer by putting it in a freezer, it kind of delays the digestion and you don't get that burpees, that nasty fish oil burpees. You know, that would be an interesting thing for a class activity if I bring in fish oil and see what you guys think about it. Anyway, um, ni nicene, it's just your general nicene that you can get at Walmart, okay? Um, a lot of times you see nicene also in uh, energy drinks, believe it or not. The big thing about nicene is that it causes flushing. Um, kind of like a hot flash, makes the face red. People really don't like it. What we can tell our patients if if they are taking the nicene is they can take an ibuprofen 30 minutes before they take the nicene and it will take um, that flushing away. Okay, we have the fibric acid derivatives, lopid and tricor. They lower the triglycerides, triglycerides. Up. Oh phone call hold on oh i can't pause okay sorry about that and then another phone call i never get phone calls and then i just get two okay anyway where were we um the low pit and the tricor lowers of triglycerides don't really have much to say about that but it is also metabolized in the liver and then we have bile acid sequestrants. Uh, Questran. Questran is a really cool kind of medication. It's in a little packet, orange flavored. Um, it does help lower the cholesterol. But what's really cool is if you are having diarrhea, like idiopathic, there's no rhyme or reason why you're having diarrhea. It is also, it helps firm poo. So a lot of times you will be given the um, Questran and it's not because of cholesterol. It's just because they have diarrhea and we're trying to solidify it. So there you go on that one. So here's a question. Would you give this to a patient that is constipated? Probably not a great idea. Not unless you want to sink an NG tube. Okay. General diagnostic testing. So you come in with chest pain or you're feeling kind of crummy, we're going to do lipid profiles. And you will need to know the lipids um, values, okay, your lipid profile values. And we want to know the desired, okay. See reactive protein for inflammation, the homocysteine levels, although I have not seen one drawn, you still could. EKG or ECG, exercise ECG, myocardial perfusion imaging we can give you and we also can do a coronary angiography.
screen and diagnosis. This is a kind of a little cool thing. So with an EKG, what we do is we measure the electro electrical impulses of the heart. With a stress test, what we're doing is we're measuring the blood supply to the heart. And then, of course, we have the cardio angio angiography. And what we're doing is looking for the narrowing of the vessels. OK, so we want to see where the narrowing in the arteries, where the narrowing is. OK, angina or angina, depending on what part of the United States you're from. So it's chest pain resulting from a reduced coronary blood flow, which means that there is a need for oxygen and the blood's just not getting where it needs to go. OK, there's the demand is outweighing um, the supply. Possible causes are CAD. Exercise, hyperthyroid, stimulant use, stress, anemia, heart failure, cardiomyopathy, and pulmonary diseases are all reason causes for CAD. And CAD is not the same as an MI. CAD is just, it's ischemia. So the cells aren't dying, okay? They're being deprived of oxygen. But the cool thing about this is when you stop your exercise, stop your illicit drugs, stop your stimulant abuse, then... So the angina goes away. Okay, stable angina is if you're going and you're mowing the grass and you start having chest pain and then all of a sudden you stop mowing the grass and sit down and the chest pain goes away. Why is that? Well, when you're mowing, and I'm not talking about Z-turn mowing, I'm talking about push mowing. When you're using that heart and it needs more oxygen, you're going to have chest pain. Okay, if you are diagnosed with stable angina. When you stop, the heart doesn't have to work so hard to get oxygen to the rest of the body. And therefore, the need of oxygen decreases and the chest pain goes away. Now, there's other ways we can get rid of the chest pain, but we're going to go keep it at that for right now. Prismensal or variant angina, that's actually a, uh, a spasming. Okay, and it usually happens in no rhyme or reason when it happens. It just happens. Um, generally, it happens at night. And so what we would do is we'll give the patient a medication so to help with that spasming. And that medication is often a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker. Okay, and then unstable angina. What that is is you had angina, and every time that you had chest pain, you stopped, or you took a nitro, and the pain went away. But what happens is that with the unstable angina is that you stopped, you took your nitro, you actually took three nitro and the pain's still coming. So that says that there's something more happening. Okay, so it's unstable, progressing to ACS, which is also progressing to an MI. Okay, stable angina typically lasts about 20 minutes. Okay, often described as tightness or pressure to the chest, radiating to the jaw, neck. You know, they almost feel like they're having a heart attack. Okay. But we can stop it, okay? It's usually related to, well, I don't know what happened there. We're usually related to exercise, stress, anxiety, calculation tests, things like that. Well, okay, EKG, well, that makes sense, right? So what we're going to do is somebody comes in with chest pain, and we're going to do an EKG no matter what. If that EKG shows normal, or maybe there's a little dip in the ST segment, then it, we can put it as stable angina, okay? Um, we're also going to look at troponins, but an EKG can also show the stable angina. Okay, cardiac markers. The cardiac markers that we're going to use are troponins and CKMB. Okay, troponins... Um, are really cool. They're in your heart anyway. They're in a heart muscle. But when they have, if there's any damage to the heart muscle, they're released into the bloodstream. And that's why they're considered cardiac markers. Now, those troponins can really happen for any reason. Say you have pneumonia, you're constantly coughing. Okay. Maybe you were in a car accident, your chest went against the steering wheel. Um, patients with um, CHF, they their troponins are high, are always elevated. When I say elevated, is anything above 0 0.012 is considered an elevation. 
So a person with CHF might come into the hospital and they're 0 .0, uh, let's say, 5-2. Well, it's kind of expected because of the fact that their heart is not working like it should. So it's damaged, okay? Um, with the cardiac markers, it takes about six hours for it to actually um, make it into the bloodstream. So if you are having chest pain right now, and we're like, oh, if you're having chest pain, let's draw troponins. It's not going to make it into the bloodstream that quick. Okay, it will show it will show negative. So when you come into a hospital and you are having chest pain, what they'll do is they'll do an EKG. They'll do you know what they have to do, CBC, CMP, all the regular um, labs, and they'll draw the troponins. But then they will have you wait there until they can draw troponins, three sets of troponins just to make sure that, yes, your chest pain's now, but your troponins aren't going to show in six hours. So, unfortunately, that's a longer time in the hospital, but it's very necessary. And then, of course, we're going to do a, a CKMB. CKMB shows, CK shows muscle damage anywhere in the body. It's not specific, but CKMB is specific to the heart muscle. And relieved by... Stable angina is relieved by nitro, okay? It's either relieved by sitting down, relaxing, or it's relieved by nitro. Okay. Okay, management of angina. I'm sure you went over this with uh, Casey in 109. So management of angina, nitrates, sublingual, transdermal, oral, or IV. What it does is it vasodilates. Remember vasodilation? So if it vasodilates, that means it decreases the afterload. So if it decreases the afterload, that means the, uh, blah, blah. the heart does not have to work so hard to get the blood to the rest of the body. So it doesn't have to work so hard. If the heart, heart does not have to work so hard, that means it doesn't need additional oxygen. Does that make sense? So by dilation, we're decreasing the workload of the heart, okay, because we're decreasing the afterload. Okay, sublinguals can be taken every five minutes times three. Now, depending on what website you look up, some people are set, some websites say after you take the second one to call, call 911 and get to the hospital. Others say take three, and if it doesn't help, go to 911 and call the hospital. Well, really, you have to really crit critically think where you're at. If you're in the middle of the wheat field and you're having chest pain and you've taken two nitro and it's not working, then possibly you should call 911 now, okay? Um, if you're working in a hospital and you've taken three, then, yeah, by the third one, you can walk yourself down to the ER. Well, maybe you shouldn't walk, drive, or ride. Okay, so I don't test on when you should call 911. What I test on is that you can take it every five minutes times three. If you're in the hospital and your pa patient is complaining about chest pain, you walk in, they say, oh, it hurts. Okay, get out the nitro. You take a blood pressure. The blood pressure is stable. You can give them one. Make sure they don't swallow it. What you want to do is sublingual so it goes into the mouth, underneath the tongue. It's very vascular under there. It will get to the rest of the body faster, okay, if it keeps to the tongue. Don't give it to them and give them a glass of water. Not a good idea. Then, after five minutes, they're still complaining, oh, it hurts. Then you take the blood pressure again. If it's still stable, you can give your, third, your second one and then repeat, repeat the process for the, for the third one. If after the third one, it's not looking, uh, the patient's not showing any relief whatsoever, then I would turn around and call um, the EKG. Quite honestly, probably after the second one. If the second one's not, you know, a couple minutes after the second one, if that's not working, I would probably get on the horn and call EKG because you don't know where they're at in the hospital, okay? Um, educate on the proper administration and side effects and storage. So proper administration, take one every five minutes times three. Side effects, a headache, okay? If you would touch a uh, nitro paste, be prepared to have a, a really big headache, okay? Storage, there, um, the nitroglycerins are little brown bottles 
and they're only good for about six months. It used to be that if you put them under your tongue and you felt like a stinging in your tongue, then they were still good, okay? They messed the formulary up a little bit so you don't feel that stinging anymore, um, but you have to tell your patients that once they open it up, they only have six months to use it. Also, you don't want to put it in a hot place. So front pocket of jeans is not a good idea. Um, they do have little necklaces they can put them on or, you know, it's not really a great idea for ladies to put it in their purse because a lot of times when they're having the chest pain, they're nowhere near their purse. Okay, so you need to educate your patients. You know, medication is not going to work if it's not near you when you need it. Okay, um, advise the patient that they can take actually nitro before an activity. Say they're going to go visit a friend's house on the second floor, and they know that every time they walk up those stairs, they get chest pain. They can take actually a nitro before they go up those steps and prevent themselves from having an anginal attack. And what effects do we will we look the will we need to look for with nitro? Well, blood pressure, a decrease in blood pressure, is the big thing. Okay, so if a patient is taking nitro, the last thing you want them to do is continue standing up. Maybe they should sit down, okay, so they don't have a hypotensive episode. And I really should have probably talked a little bit more about, okay, though I'm on this screen, let me talk a little bit more about um, the nitro. You have the sublingual, there's transdermal, we have patches, and we also have paste. And I will bring in a paper and what the paste looks like, or what the paper looks like that we put it on. And when you're talking about transdermal, you have to apply it anywhere above the knees. Okay, you can't go below the knees. A lot of people think you have to put it right over the chest, but think about it. We're not doing it for the heart per se. What we're doing is we want it to be absorbed into the skin to cause vasodilation. So it just needs to be somewhere above the knees on a hairless spot. Nothing irks me when you have a hairy chest and the nitro patch is placed on top of that hairy chest and really it's not even touching the skin. You know, that hair does not absorb lotion very well, okay? It doesn't absorb paste or nitro very well. So make sure it's a nice clean spot and that if it's a hairy chest, well, get out, you know, sorry, but get out the shavers. Um, also, we have long acting nitro. It's isoborb mononitrate, isoborb dinonitrate. Um, that's long acting and it works for 24 hours. They might get a dose in the morning and at night, but it is 24 hours. And uh, there is spray, but I can imagine that's really very expensive on the spray. Oh, one other thing with the nitro paste or patch, we take it off every off 12 hours. We don't want people to sleep with it. Okay, they don't need it at night. Their heart's not, you know, beating extra heavy at night or, you know, need increased oxygenation at night. So we take it off at night and we rotate those patches. Okay, we don't want it at the same place every time. Although some people like to do it that way because they'll remember where they're at. Unfortunately, we have to be not so nice and tell them to put them in other places. Okay, management of angina, beta blockers, decreases the workload of the heart by decreasing afterload. We kind of talked about that with the vasodilators, right? Calcium channel blockers also reduce H, um, heart rate and they're pretty good for um, the variant angina. Uh, Renexa is a chronic, we can use uh, Renexa. We've been seeing it a little bit more lately. Um, low dose aspirin, 81 milligrams, is reduced the uh, risk for platelet aggregation. So it's an antiplatelet. Also, there is clopidogrel, um, there's pasigrel, and tigre the, the tiagrigrel. Uh, those are all antiplatelets. What you're probably used to is a clodpidogrel, which is a platyx. Okay, when somebody goes into um, a heart cath and they have stent placement, place, the stent placement, you will see that we will give the 81 milligrams um, of aspirin and plavix post um, cath. And the plavix they will be on for a full year. 
Okay, what the Plavix does is it doesn't allow the platelets to form, to aggregate around the stent. Okay, that's my third phone call. Okay, so, because I don't know where I was. Okay, antiplatelet. Um, so for the Plavix, they'll be on there for a year. Oh yeah, the stent placement, the what the platelets would like to do is look at that stent as a foreign object and they feel like they have to fix it. Okay, something's wrong, I gotta fix it. And so they'll aggregate around that, that stint. The plavis is an added security so that it does not, that doesn't happen. So it doesn't clot off on that stint. And some problems with plavix is that, you know, of course an increase in bleeding. So we're gonna tell our patients, hey, watch out for bloody stools, hematuria, um, bruising, that kind of thing. Okay, before they stop plavix, um, the doctor who prescribed it is the only one that should stop it. So your dentist can't say, hey, you're coming to get your teeth, tooth pulled, so stop your Plavix five days prior. No, they have to have prior authorization from your cardiologist or whatever doctor prescribed it. Um, no other doctor should say, stop it. In fact, if a patient calls you and says, hey, I have lactari stools, you can't, you know, you as a nurse can't say, okay, stop taking your Plavix, you know, and call it a day because plavix is so important. And if those platelets will aggregate on that stent, it could cause them an MI, okay? And we don't want to practice outside our um, license and cause somebody's death. Unstable angina is that angina that um, is not stopping with the nitro. So you have, it lasts longer than 20 minutes. No matter what you do, you can't get rid of the pain. Um, could be dyspnea, diaphoretic, tachycardic hypotension. The ST segment depression will be there, okay? And you might even have a T wave inversion. The cardiac mar markers, if it's unstable, it might be elevated a little bit. Now, if you have regular angina stable, stable angina, the cardiac monitors will not be, markers will not be elevated at all. Unstable, they might be a little bit like, like your CHF patient, maybe it'll be like 0 0.022, something like that. It's not very much, okay? And no matter what we do, we can't relieve that pain, okay? Unstable angina and acute coronary syndrome is kind of like an umbrella term. So it includes unstable angina progressing to an MI. So what's happened to this patient is they've had that, that narrowing. Remember we, a couple of slides back, they have that narrowing. Well, something for whatever reason, maybe a part of other plaque has broken off in the artery and it's occluded or maybe made the um, artery a little bit even narrower. That's what's happening to it's not, the heart's not dying as of right now, but if we don't do something, it could happen. It could cause an MI. So it's not something we just sit around and say, oh, you have acute coronary syndrome, we'll come back in about two days and we'll do a cardiac cath. No, what we want to do is stabilize that patient and take them down to cardiac cath as soon as we can. It's not like an MI where we want to get them down within 60 minutes. We, we take our time, we get the nitro on board, we have help them, you know, relax, we do the whole spiel in which we're gonna go into, and then we get down in cath lab when it's convenient for us. We don't like doing things in a hurried way. We wanna do it with us, okay? Okay, and this is what I'm gonna talk about. So you have this, this plaque right here, and what could happen is you can have a plaque rupture, and with that rupture, you can actually get a blood clot or your platelets could aggregate in that system saying, oh, look, there's a problem. I got to fix it. Okay. You know, platelets are good when they're, they're needed, but when they're not needed, they can kill you. Okay. So you can have a little blood clot come through here and clot that off also. And then it reroutes the blood. And this is where your point of MI is. Okay. Management of ACS nitrates. At this point in time, the patient is taking the three nitro, it's not working, okay? So what we probably will start doing is doing IV nitro, okay? And with the IV nitro, the way we know it's working is we ask about the level of chest pain. Now remember, with, with nitro, it's going to decrease the blood, um, blood pressure. So we're going to monitor the blood pressure 
and also the chest pain. Okay, if they're still having chest pain and their blood pressure can't take, you know, us titrating any more of, of that nitro, you know, we need to start thinking about getting them down to the cath lab. But if their blood pressure or if their pain is great, you know, say it went from a 10 down to a one and they're feeling good, we can hold off and we just keep it at that one point in time. Beta blockers also help because remember, we are decreasing the workload of the heart. So we are causing a decrease in afterload, which helps the heart and not need so much oxygen. We will also give them 325 of aspirin. It's 325, and again, these are chewable aspirin. We don't want them to take it with a glass of water and go all the way through the digestive system. We want them to chew it and let it get into the vascular system through the mouth, okay? We can also give them Plavix, actually um, preload them with Plavix. Oh, I want to say it's three Plavix. Plavix is 75 milligrams that we can give before um, uh, they go to the cath lab to help with the aggregation. And then we have I IV antiplatelet, the Rio Pro, Integral, and Agristat. Um, generally, if you were, well, we were all at Good Sam, you'll see that we would use Agristat and thrombolytics. Thrombolytics are cool. So heparin, Coumadin, none of them bus clots, okay? But the thrombolytics, those bus clots, thrombolytics were brought to us um, generally because we didn't have cath labs. You know, you would have a MI, you'd be sitting in a hospital, you need to get transferred to St. Louis, St. Louis was busy or they couldn't get you there. And instead of just making you sit there, you know, and having your heart die, what they could do is the thr thrombolytics. The thrombolytics um, goes into um, your vein and it busts that clot up, okay? Problem with thrombolytics is because it busts that clot, it also, you have a higher risk for bleeding. So you really have to outweigh the pros and the cons. Now, if you've had a massive injury, if you had a history of GI bleed, um, if you're pregnant, if you had surgery within the last five days, you're not a candidate for thrombolytics, okay? Because the risk is too outweighs it, outweighs the benefits. Um, now we use it for ischemic stroke. So if you come in and you have a stroke and we know you're last known well, which means we knew that you were walkie talkie two hours ago, we can give you a thrombolytic, but we have to go through the procedures. Uh, we had a patient and it was actually this nurse's first day on the floor by herself and she had a stroke. Uh, they went through the whole procedure. They sent her down a CAT scan, was an ischemic stroke. They gave her TPA and she ended up with five brain bleeds. You know, we couldn't foresee that would happen, you know, so that's why it's, it's not done on, oh, let's, well, we'll just give it to them. We really have to weigh the benefits versus um, the, the problems. Okay, we kind of talked about um, cath lab earlier, remember your second day? So what do we usually use it for? It's percutaneous coronary revascularization. So you can hear the cath lab as cath lab, you can hear the car, um, cardiac catheterization, you can hear, um, you might hear it as a PCR. Um, you also might hear it as an angiography. So there's a, all kinds of different re ways to say cath lab. But it's because of unrelieved medical therapy, unstable angina, acute MI, and significant stenosis of the LAD. So there's three different ways that we can um, help you out if you have a narrowing. We can do, you see the nice little narrowed artery. We can do a rotational burr. Quite honestly, this scares the crap out of me because what happens if he sneezes while he does this? So it's actually kind of like what you would do like with a cl clogged toilet, okay? And that little burr basically takes that plaque and demolishes it into smithereens, okay? With this burr, they won't do the rotational burr unless they have it in, um, cardiovascular surgeon um, on staff in the hospital, just in case something would happen. The other one is a balloon. So they take that catheter, slide it up through the artery, and then they put that balloon, normal saline in that balloon, and they push, oh, I didn't mean to write, they push the plaque up against the walls. 
okay? And then we have the stint, okay, the stint placement. All of them, all of these procedures basically give you, get rid of that plaque that is causing your problems. Okay, and we talked about the care of the calf patient, MPO, informed consent, you need two IV accesses, one on each arm, and that's because in case they can't get in the one side, they can switch and go on the other side, you still have access um, to IVs. Remember, hold a hypo, hypoglycemics insulin, um, we do not give Lovenox or diuretics. Uh, we can give all the regular medications and we administer 325 of aspirin and education, education, education. We want them to understand what's going to happen when they come back up from the cath lab. Remember, they're laying flat for four hours. Okay, post procedural vitals, usually 15 times four, Q30 times two and Q1 hour times four. Telemetry monitoring, we want to know what's going on before or we want to know what's going on with the patient afterwards. Bed rest, nothing higher than 30 degrees. Monitor for vasal vagal response. It does happen, guys. I'm telling you, that vagal nerve, uh, we had a patient and he was doing great. His wife came out to me and it's like, oh, he's not feeling so good. Go back in. And he, his heart rate is in the 30s. I mean, he looked, he looked horrid. Um, called Stace charge nurse she came in we called the code we gave him some atropine he popped right back up and when he was you know feeling a little bit better and his heart rate was in the 80s he looked at us and he said well you know that happened the last time i had a cardiac calf what the heck you know this is kind of the stuff that you should share with your nurses you know so that we don't freak out and monitor for dye reaction remember we're using um we have to find out if they're allergic to the iodine because we are using um, dye. So we're monitoring that response also. And education, education, education. Remember, they keep their lane flat. Um, and if they have to cough, they want to put pressure on that calf site so they don't pop the angioseal. Okay, if we're unable to fix you with a... Uh, with a cardiac cath, we're going to end up giving you a cabbage. And that cabbage is a coronary artery bypass graft. Okay, let's see, I think I have, there you go. So basically what we're doing is we're taking vessels from your legs or your arms, and we are rerouting that blood flow around your heart. Okay, it's bypassing those blocked vessels. There's people that get um, cabbages, multi-vessel disease, so two or more vessels is generally what we see. Um, left main disease or they have an impaired left ventricle function related to, you know, the disease process. Some of the newer techniques that they have is off-pump, which means that they actually, and it's really kind of cool, they're able to do a cabbage and they're off Mo the, the cabbages usually they're on um, bypass, okay, which means that their blood leaves their body, goes into a machine that breathes, you know, adds oxygen, and then comes back in. So the heart actually stops. Now there's a one thing. There's a different now procedures where they don't even have to be on that pump, and they really do a lot better. They don't need the chest tubes. They don't need the um, they don't have some of the complications of patients that have been on the pump. There's a mid cab, which is minimally invasive, which they use smaller incisions, um, video assisted vein harvesting. What they used to do is basically fillet you. So they would open up your legs, they would fillet you from your knees down to your ankles to look for veins. And we would, before we they would do that, they would do some Dopplers to see what veins the best, but they wouldn't go flay you open, get your veins, take the veins out and use those veins. Um, be prior, before putting them in your heart, they would actually put saline through those veins just to see if there's any holes or, you know, what valves are in there because you don't want a lot of valves, you know, and they would go from there. Um, problem is if that vein wasn't good, then they would have to flay the other leg open. Okay, so you can imagine the pain of having a cabbage, having your leg opened up like that. Then you add to the fact that a lot of these patients are diabetic. 
They probably have some PVD and PAD going on. So it's impaired healing. So we had some issues with um, infection, okay? You know, we've gotten a lot better with the video assisted. So they put a little site, a uh, little incision on the top of the leg and a little incision on the back bottom. And they use a video camera to look at the veins of which veins they want. And they're able to take it out through those little holes. So much better. The recovery time is so much better. And then you have transmyocardial laser revascularization. Okay. And that is for those folks that can't go through a cabbage. I mean, for whatever reason, maybe they're too ill of health or maybe they have comorbidities. You know, they just can't do it. Um, we can try to use a transmy TMLR. Okay. Care of the cabbage patient. Pre op. Patient teaching, patient teaching, you know, walking in and seeing um, your loved one out on a, you know, ventilator with 12 different meds hanging, you know, from the IVs is a horrible sight, I am sure. So let the family know what to expect. Let the patient know what they expect. You know, this isn't gallbladder surgery. They're not going to wake up and say, okay, you're done. Let's go home. Okay. They're going to be in a hospital for about a week. Um, verify pre-op labs available for base for baseline later. So what's their CBS, CBC, CMP? You know, is it elevated after the surgery? Type and cross for at least four units. We would type and cross for four units of red pack, packed blood cells, um, four of FFP and four of platelets. Okay, when the p patients go on pump, they have their blood has to be thin enough that it's not going to clot. So they throw enough heparin in there so it doesn't clot while they're in the machine, while it's going through the machine. Well, guess what? When it's done and they're closing them up, now they have to thicken that blood up so they don't bleed, you know, bleed out. So that's why we need the FFP and the platelets. Um, special bathing protocols. The way we used to do it was they bathed in the chlorohexidine, those wonderful showers that nobody gets to use in our hospital. They got to use those showers. So they would bathe the um, afternoon before, they would bathe with chlorhexidine that night, and then they would bathe again in the morning um, of their surgery with the chlorhexidine. Emotional support, it sucks. We are going to be taking, I mean, these people, you know, if they're working, they're looking to be in out of their jobs for about six months at least, depending on their job. Um, they're not going to be the breadwinner anymore. You know, my gosh, is my heart. I mean, scary guys. I'm scared enough. I got two pins in my pinky and I was freaking out. I can't imagine going in to a surgery where they're opening your chest with a saw, um, and being real calm about it. I'm pretty sure they'd have to sedate me with propofol before I get a cabbage. Okay. Education, education, you know, incentive spirometer. Okay. It's really important after that they're on a incentive spirometer, um, protein, you know, how they're going to walk, you know, what to expect, everything. Don't leave anything unturned, especially a size ICU as post-op. They're going to go to ICU for a couple days. Okay. Within 24 hours, actually within probably eight hours, they should be off the vent. Okay. Watch for S3 gallop, and that's an early sign for heart failure. And if they have muffled sounds, that's a sign of tamponade. And tamponade is when the blood is going around the pericardial sac and basically it is uh, suffocating the heart. Okay. If you start hearing muffled heart sounds, you don't get out the Doppler. You call the doctor and say, you're hearing muffled heart sounds. We got to do something. Monitor for dysrhythmias. Monitor for uh, chest tube drainage. They should be... Uh, when they first get out, they might have a little bit higher of a mark, maybe 50 cc's an hour. But once they start getting greater than 70 to 100 mils an hour of bleeding, of blood or fluid, it's showing that they have a bleed. Monitor urine output because you know that's showing decreased cardiac output and could show a hemorrhage. And they might have pacemaker, um, temporary pacemaker at bedside. They would be Venus um, pacemakers. Okay, post-op complications, dysrhythmias, and heart failure, number one. Okay, but they could have cardiogenic shock, stroke, pain, 
atelectasis, sternal infection, although luckily we didn't have that problem, alternation in taste and depression. Think about it. We're opening up your chest, so it's not like gallbladder surgery or I don't know whether append appendix or anything like that, that you're going to pop up within a couple of days and be great. Okay. It's hurts. And you're talking about six months being out of, out of your work, depending on what you do. You're also not allowed to lift up 10 pounds. So you can't lift up more than a gallon of milk until you go and see um, the doctor for your follow-up. Okay. So, you know, you, you're really restrained. Okay. A lot of that could cause some depression. So we really have to talk to our patients about that and their family and how to recognize that, you know, how to help them through this. Okay, so I think I'm gonna stop there. And we will go and talk about myocardial infarctions um, on Tuesday, okay? I hope you enjoyed this wonderful presentation. And I think that I have never gotten so many phone calls or interruptions in my life. Should have probably done this at home. So have a great weekend. I'll talk to you later.